This program is rated PG. It contains themes and scenes which may not be suitable for very young audiences. Parental guidance is advised. We're working to connect a region of over 600 more bridges between our lands. Welcome to ASEAN in Focus. I'm Alma Angeles, and we're coming to you live from Manila and Bangkok, Thailand. Here's Faye. Hello, Faye. Hello, and welcome, everyone. Live here in Thailand, I am Faye Barta, giving you the latest news in the dynamic ASEAN region. On today's headlines. Myanmar's ambassador to Britain accused the Yangon military link figure of occupying the embassy and barring him access in an extraordinary diplomatic standoff a month after the envoy called for the junta to release ousted civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi. The United States on Wednesday warned China against what the Philippines see as increasingly aggressive Aggressive moves reminding Beijing of Washington's obligations to its partners. Dr. Nina Gloriani, head of the Vaccine Development Expert Panel of the DOSD Philippines, announced that the Corona vaccine, CoronaVac vaccine manufactured by Sinovac Biotech Limited based in China can now be used to vaccinate senior citizens. Malacanian canceled the scheduled talk to the nation of President Rodrigo Duterte on Wednesday night, April 7, amid reports that at least 45 members of the Presiden Presidential Security Group, or PSG, had tested positive for COVID-19. Myanmar's ambassador to Britain accused a Yangon military link figure of occupying the embassy Wednesday and bearing him access in an extraordinary diplomatic standoff a month after the envoy called for the junta to release ousted civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Protesters gathered outside the building in London's Mayfair neighborhood with the ambassador Kuao Zuar Min. As reports emerged, he had been locked out. When asked who was inside, this is what he said. Take a listen. Uh, this is kind of cool. Okay. Thank you. Who is in the building? Um, uh, defense uh, attache. They occupy my embassy. The ambassador told AFP that he would stay outside the embassy all night, explaining this is my building. Ambassador Kuao Zuarmin last month broke ranks with his country's military junta. The ambassador, the UK ambassador to the... Uh, the, the ambassador issued a statement last uh, month calling for Suu Kyi's uh, release Kyi. from detention okay. and pledged okay. to keep the embassy, embassy. open okay. following a call okay. with UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab. At that time, the Foreign Secretary Raab said in a tweet that he spoke to the ambassador and praised his courage and patriotism in standing up for what is right. He said diplomacy is the only response and answer to the current impasse. Kwao Zwar Min. The ambassador said in the statement that was tweeted by British Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab. Britain's Foreign Office, which has been a strong critic of the coup, said it was seeking further information following this incident at Myanmar's embassy in London. And the Metropolitan Police said they were aware uh, of the situation. Kwar kind of okay. Zwar Min told the Daily Telegraph that when I left the embassy, the they stormed uh, inside the embassy and uh, took it. Defense, Myanmar's uh, military leaders defense. tried in vain the, uh, to remove another embassy. diplomat in March after UN Ambassador Kwao Mo Tun called on the international community members to use any means necessary to help restore the country's civilian leadership. He refused to step down, however, a decision that has been supported by the United Nations.
A group representing Myanmar outside civilian government said Wednesday it has gathered 180 pieces or 180,000 pieces of evidence showing rights abuses by the junta, including torture and extrajudicial killings. The country has been in turmoil since the army deposed civilian leader Aung San Suu Kyi on February 1, with nearly 600 people killed in a crackdown and anti coup protests. A lawyer for the committee for representing Ki Daung Su Lu Tao CRPH, a group of MPs from Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy or NLD party, met UN investigators Wednesday to discuss alleged acrotesis by the junta. CRPH has received 180,000 items of evidence. This evidence shows wild-scale abuses of human rights by the military, the group said in a statement. They include more than 540 extrajudicial executions, 10 deaths of prisoners in custody, torture, illegal detentions, and disproportionate use of force against peaceful protests, the statement said. Demonstrators' demonstrations calling for the return of democracy and the release of Suu Kyi from detention have rocked Myanmar almost daily since the coup. Civil servants, doctors, and other key workers have downed tools as part of a civil disobedience movement aimed at preventing the military from running the country. In a related news, a leading Myanmar actor, singer, and model who has backed the country's anti-coup protest was arrested on Thursday, according to reports, as the junta hunts more than 100 celebrities for supporting the movement. The country has been rocked by daily protests since the military seized power on February 1, and the authorities have launched a bloody crackdown on dissent with hundreds killed and more than 2,500 arrested. Pine Tak Kwon, 24, a star in both Myanmar and neighboring Thailand, has been active in the protest movement, both in person, at rallies, and through his massive social media following. He was taken into custody in the North Dagon area of Yangon at 5 a.m., or 22.30 GMT, um, from his mother's home, according to local media reports. According to recent posts on his social media, where he had more than a million followers and Facebook and Instagram, he has been in poor health. Pang Tai Kon is almost famous, also famous in Thailand, and has appeared in TV commercials and shows. Now in other news, the United States on Wednesday warned China against what the Philippines see as increasingly aggressive moves, reminding Beijing of Washington's obligations to its partners. Let's watch this. Well, um, uh, Secretary Blinken uh, actually spoke to this uh, just a couple days ago. Um, he said on March 28 uh, that the United States stands with our ally, uh, the Philippines, uh, in the face of the PRC's maritime militia uh, amass amassing at uh, Whitson Reef. He said we will always stand uh, by uh, our allies and stand up for uh, the rules-based international order. Uh, as we have stated before, an armed attack against the Philippines' armed forces, public vessels, or aircraft in the Pacific, including in the South China Sea, uh, will trigger our obligations under the U.S.-Philippines Mutual Defense Treaty. Um, when it comes to this amassing, as the Secretary said, uh, we share the concerns of our Philippine allies regarding uh, the continued reported uh, amassing of PRC maritime uh, militia uh, near uh, Whitson Reef. Uh, and uh, we have seen the reports that vessels have also spread uh, to other parts of the South China Sea. Uh, we have reiterated our strong support for the Philippines, and we have called on the PRC to abide by the 2016 Arbitral Tribunal Award under the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, which is final and legally binding on all parties. More than 200 Chinese boats were first spotted on March 7 with Whitsun Reef, around 200 or 320 kilometers or 200 miles west of Palawan Island, the contested South China Sea, although many have since scattered across the Spratly Islands. China, which claims almost the entirety of the resource-rich sea, has refused weeks of appeals by the Philippines to withdraw the vessels which Manila says unlawfully entered its exclusive economic zone.
President Joe Biden has vowed a robust defense of allies and in a rare point of continuity with his predecessor, Donald Trump, has supported strong pushback against Chinese assertive. In other news, Malaysia will proceed with the use of AstraZeneca vaccine. The EMA yesterday said that it found rare cases of blood clots among some adult vaccine recipients, although it said the vaccine's advantages still outweigh the risks. Alfred Balmes from our EBC Malaysia Bureau joins us live. Hello, Alfred. Hello, Alma. Finally, Malaysia will proceed with using the AstraZeneca vaccine after deciding that the benefits of the vaccine might outweigh the negatives. According to the health minister, that took Siri, Dr. <coughs> Anhambaba, the Special Committee on COVID-19 Vaccine Supply Access Guarantee meeting yesterday had discussed the safety of the vaccine following concerns about the occurrence of blood clots and small number of recipients. They also discussed the usage of the AstraZeneca vaccine from the United Kingdom. The reason why Malaysia will proceed with AstraZeneca because the clinical data has shown that there are more benefit, benefits that's negative with this vaccine. Expert at the meeting discussed several issues relating to AstraZeneca, particularly the discovery of blood clots cases among recipients of the vaccine. The minister said also Malaysia had agreed to procure the AstraZeneca vaccine. The country had not yet received them, but they have agreed to procure them from Thailand and also from the COVAX facility based in South Korea. Malaysia is scheduled to receive deliveries of about 6.4 million doses of, of the AstraZeneca vaccine in May for the use of 3.2 million people. Dr. Alham and, Trans and Transport Ministry Datuk Siri, Dr. Wi Kasyong, witnessed the signing of ceremony of an MOU between the two ministries. The documents were signed by Health Minister Secretary General Datuk Muhammad Shafiq Abdullah and Transport Ministry Secretary General Datuk Isham Isha. The agreement will see both ministries collaborate to develop programs that will produce competent ambulance driver. Dr. Adham added the government would also enact a law base of on the emergency management system in many developed countries which would focus on ambulance safety. About 2,500 ambulance drivers attached to the ministry who would benefit from the driving competency and safety programs under the new collaboration. Back to you, Alma. Thank you very much, Alfred, for your update. Looking forward to more updates coming from Malaysia. You stay safe, take care. Thank you. Reporting from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, this is Alfred Ralmes. We live in interesting times. sa kesaya-saya. Pangalawang linggo na ng lockdown sa Barangay Aguila. Kaya extended din ang problema ko nang makasira ako ng gamit sa bahay ng BFF ko. Si Bebeng at mami niya, hindi pa din makapag-adjust sa isa't isa. Lalo na si Kapitan, na sobrang homesick at gigil na gigil nang makauwi pero wala siyang masakyan. Kaya ano pang hinihintay ninyo? Abangan ng extended na katatawanan ngayong linggo dito sa Kesaya Saya. Sumaya tayong lahat. Kesaya Saya, tuwing linggo, alas 6.30 ng gabi, dito lang sa Net 25.
Teka nga muna. Nasaan si Cap? Malapit na kayo ako. Welcome back to the program. Malacanang Council, the scheduled talk to the nation of President Rodrigo Duterte on Wednesday night, April 7, amid reports that at last 45 members of the Presidential Security Group, or PSG, had tested positive for COVID-19. Presidential spokesperson Harry Roque explained that the preparation for the talk to the people address entails a number of staff complement, and we also take due consideration of their well-being. The commander of the PSG, General Jesus Durante, meanwhile, assured the public that President Duterte remains safe and in good health. He said that the 45 active COVID-19 cases among the PSG were security personnel who are mostly manning the gates of the Malacanian compound and were not directly or closely detailed with the president. In an interview over the state-run channel PTV4, the PSG chief said that while the number of PSG personnel who contracted COVID-19 reached 126, only 45 of these were active cases. He said that the PSG would not take reason, would not recommend activities that would endanger the president's health, such as meetings that would expose him to a number of people. The spike in COVID-19 cases, which was even higher than last year's peak, was not isolated in the Philippines as this was also reported in various countries amid the presence of new highly infectious variants of the COVID-19 virus. Meanwhile, Dr. Nina Gloriani, head of the Vaccine Development Expert Panel of the DOST Philippines, announced that the CoronaVac COVID-19 vaccine manufactured by Sinovac Biotech Limited based in China can be used to vaccinate senior citizens, the A2 priority list, to protect them from the virus. Let's listen in. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, po, no, you say Kraki. Actually, na evaluate na namin siya before. If we look at the safety profile, ito we're just talking about the yung senior citizens, no? Maganda ang kanyang safety profile, mild to moderate ang mga signs and symptoms. Ito ay base sa pag-aaral sa Brazil. Although ko konti yung mga senior na napasama dun sa study, around 400. Sa China, meron din ganoong study, mga 422 naman. Na ganun din, mild to moderate ang mga side effects, usually yung pain lang sa injection site at uh, headache. The uh, would last about two days, eh, tapos wala na. So maganda po yung profile niya. Ngayon, siguro ang pa, pinaka naging um, issue noon ay yung efficacy niya na medyo mababa. Kasi nga, kulang pa po yung taong nag-participate doon sa trial. Pero... Uh, ang maganda doon sa datos na nakita namin ay hindi ay nakakaprotekta siya din siya sa mga matatanda ha na hindi sila nagkaroon ng severe covid. Sa so doon pa rin yung kagaya ng sinasabi natin sa ibang mga bakuna, nagkakaroon pwede magkaroon ng mild pero hindi sila nagkaroon ng severe covid. Kaya maganda po 'yon kahit ko konti yung nakitang uh, subjects na uh, but they're still uh, considering, of course, uh, trying to analyze more data as we go along. Ano pa ang pwede ko sabihin? Sa China po ay nagsimula na nitong March uh, and up to mas umpisa na ng mas malawakan itong April. Yung pagbakuna sa kanilang more than 60 years old na age group. Sa ano po, sa Indonesia ay that he start na, na sa elderly na vaccination with Sinovac, Coronavac noong pang February. So, kailangan po sana tayo makaabot na rin kasi hindi natin pwedeng intayin ng matagal yung AstraZeneca. I had my Sinovac vaccine one month ago, so nakadalawang doses na po ako. So may waiver lang po ang ating mga senior citizens. I do not know if even FDA may remove that. Kasi po nasa pandemya tayo ngayon. 
at hindi po tayo pwedeng mag-delay ng mag-delay dahil yung bakuna na iniintay natin ay hindi pa dumadating. Kung ano po yung meron tayo, sana ay magamit na natin. Now, ano po, yung sa kakulangan lang po yun ng datos na pwede naman po ma-extrapolate natin yung data sa nyari doon sa 18 to 59 years old, actually na-extrapolate na po, no? nyari doon sa antibodies na na-produce noong 18 to 59. Ang mga antibodies po na na-produce noong elderly or more than 60 years old ay halos pareho. So, may extrapolation na po doon na kung mas marami ang matetes sana, lalabas na ang vaccine efficacy ay mataas din po sa. So, yun yung ating titignan. So, ang alam ko po ay maglalabas na rin soon ang FDA ng announcement about this. Ang vaccine expert panel po ay nakapag-recommenda na na pwede siyang gamitin sa senior citizen. Staying in the Philippines, in the Laging Handa Public Briefing, Dr. Nina Gloriani, head of the Vaccine Development Expert Panel of the DOST Philippines, shared her experience after getting two doses of the coronavac vaccine through the National Vaccination Program. Let's watch this. Okay, yung first dose ay pain lang talaga, pain. Dito sa left side, oh, una left. Kung saan hindi ka dominant na arm, ano? which a few hours nakalimutan ko na. Siguro dahil busy ako, pero talagang wala na. Yung second dose, medyo may pain of course, pero yung mabigat. Pero ganun din, mga 2-3 hours na wala na rin. Ginagalaw-galaw ko lang, nawala na rin siya. So other than that, wala po akong naramdaman. So I, I feel na ano, well, ako siguro yung living example ng isang senior na nakakuha ng bakuna at So, mild na mild ang tawag natin po doon. Of course, I heard from my other uh, colleagues na kay dad ko, uh, yung iba parang nagka-flu-like symptoms. Pero ganun din po, within one to two days, nawawala na. Eh, ang uh, mga bakuna ay talagang magkakaroon ng reaksyon sa ating katawan. Ibig sabihin, no, nakikita ng ating katawan na mayroong foreign body sa atin. At yung ating immune response mm -hmm. ay nagsisimula ng mag-acto. So actually, mas maganda pa nga yun ang, na meron kayong nararamdaman. Basta hindi lang po siya sobrang uh, severe or magtatagal. Usually, ang uh, ano natin dyan. In other news, Justice Secretary Menardo Guevara on Wednesday assured that the government action assured government action on a human smuggling scheme using closed vans to illegally transport persons out of the National Capital Region or NCR Plus areas, which are currently under an enhanced community quarantine or ECQ. Lugade earlier said closed vans and trucks were being used to smuggle people outside Metro Manila to waiting vents outside the coverage of the ECQ, raising concerns about the possibility of a new mode of transmission of the COVID, of the coronavirus disease. The announcement came after a video circulated on social media showing people inside a container truck with none of the individuals wearing face masks somewhere between Luzon, between Quezon Province and uh, the Bicol region, roughly eight hours from Metro Manila. Passengers contacted by the smugglers on social media are reportedly instructed to go to a pickup point and are taken out of the NCR Plus bubble, which remains on lockdown until April 11, following a surge in the number of infections. Apart from Metro Manila, included in the NCR Plus areas are the provinces of Cavite, Laguna, Rizal, and Bulacan. Staying in the Philippines, the Philippine National Police Highway Patrol Group, or PNPHPG, on Thursday said it is, has intensified anti-colorum operations to go after those involved in the illegal transport of people to and from the National Capital Region Plus area. PNPHPG Chief Brigadier, Brigadier General Alexander Tagu said he has immediately ordered HPG Regional Chiefs 
and Highway Patrol units in Calabar Zone, Bicol Region, and in Metro Manila to tighten their watch in the wake of the apprehension of a cargo truck that illegally transports people from Ragay, Camarines Sur to Takawayan, Quezon, last April. On April 4, HPG personnel in cooperation with the Land Transportation, Franchising and Regulatory Board apprehended 13 Coloran vehicles, 11 passenger vans and two cars for the same violation. The following day, personnel from the Regional Highway Patrol Units in the National Capital Region apprehended another 11 passenger vans that attempted to transport and authorize persons outside of residence to various destinations. The HPG said it also continues to work with the LTFRB Land Transportation Office and the Metropolitan Manila Development Authority in preventing the unnecessary movement or transport of people to and from Metro Manila and the neighboring provinces of Bulacan Cavite, Laguna, and Rizal. The NCR Plus is under ECQ until 11, April 11. In other news, Malaysia's scandal-plagued former Prime Minister Najib Razak is facing bankruptcy for allegedly failing to pay more than $400 million in taxes, which could bring his political career to an end. His lawyer, Mohamed Shafi Abdullah, argued earlier that the judge in the original trial did not have sufficient experience in handling criminal cases. Take a look. In history in Malaysia, uh, cases of this magnitude, this is the biggest case you can find, not just in Malaysia, but in the world. I can say that, huh? So complicated. One would expect um, a very senior judge with experience in criminal matters to be sent to hear this matter. Because you remember Dato Harun's case. Najib lost power in 2018 when his party, which had governed the Southeast Asian nation for six decades, was defeated at the polls after he became embroiled in a financial scandal. The leader and his cronies were accused of stealing billions of dollars from state investment fund 1MDB. And he has since been convicted and sentenced to 12 years in jail in the first of several trials he's facing over the fraud. Last year, a court ordered Najib who remains free on bail and is still an MP, to pay 1.69 billion ringgit or $409 million in taxes owed between 2011 and 2017. Late Tuesday, Najib said the tax officials issued a notice demanding he settle the bill plus additional costs. Otherwise, they will launch bankruptcy proceedings. If he is declared bankrupt, the ex-premier will lose his seat in parliament and be barred from standing in elections. The 67-year-old insisted he had always paid his taxes and that the case against him is politically motivated. The tax office declined to comment. The prospect of bankruptcy comes as different factions battle for control of Najib's party, the United Malays National Organization, of which he remains an influential member. Despite his involvement in the 1MDB scandal, Najib is still a popular figure with more than 4 million Facebook followers. He began an appeal against his conviction over the 1MDB scandal. Last year, he denies any wrongdoing. Now here in Thailand, Thailand now where a virus expert said that the fastest spreading British variant of COVID-19 is responsible for the latest cluster of infections that have been detected in entertainment venues across Bangkok. Yong Fu Buraban, Head of the Center of Excellence in Clinical Virology at the Faculty of Medicine, Chula Lumpur University, said, and quote, We don't know how it could have been found here given the fact that we have the state quarantine system. If possible, there should not be any travel or movement right now. If that's not possible, it is highly necessary to have strict measures to control the disease. According to the Bank of Post, Dr. Yong warned against unnecessary travel during the upcoming Songkran period when he estimated the number of new infections could skyrocket. He said since activities aimed at stimulating the economy go against the containment of COVID-19, 
the government should find a balance. He also said the, the older people infected with the British variant are the higher the risk of them developing severe symptoms. He also said currently most of the new infection cases involve young people who show no or few symptoms, which makes it more difficult to distinguish between those who are infected and those who are not. He added the infected people, however, have a heightened concentration of the virus in their throats, which increases the risk of them spreading the virus to older relatives they plan to visit during summer. In Cambodia, the Ministry of Health has reportedly carried out mass testing at a garment factory in Can Men Che and discovered up to 50 workers there were infected with the coronavirus. According to Kimmer Times, the testing and discoveries were made at the Din Han Garment Factory. This is located on Duong Niep 2 Street, Timei Village, Sankat Stone, Men Chai, uh, the, uh, in Phnom Penh. Now, the governor of Phnom Penh, Kwong Shreng, has called on all workers in this factory to come and take samples for urgent inspection by today. He also said that failure to do this will result in them being not able to work. Total cases increased to 3,024 in the country, while recoveries and active cases jumped to 1,914 and 1,085, respectively. There have been 24 deaths attributed directly to the infection, with two latest deaths reported by the Ministry of Health this morning. More than 4 million new cases of COVID-19 were reported in the last week, including more than 71,000 deaths and 11% increase, the World Health Organization has said. In its latest update on the coronavirus late on Tuesday evening, the UN Health Agency reported that the largest increases in case incidents were in India and the Western Pacific. All regions except for Africa reported increases in the number of deaths, with the largest increase from the Southeast Asia region up to 46%. By country, India and Brazil saw more than half a million new cases of infection each, followed by the United States with over 444,000 cases, in Turkey with nearly 266,000, and France over 244,000. Sabihang may pera sa basura, lalo na kung magagawa ang iba't ibang bagay mula sa mga recyclable material na inaakala ng iba na itatapo na. May ilang barangay sa bansa ang nagre-recycle ng basura at makikita ang iba't ibang bagay na gawa sa basura. sa bahay Sa mga proyektong ito, nagiging malinis ang kapaligiran bukod sa mayroon pang pagkakakitaan.
Welcome back. High-income countries may emerge from COVID-19 crisis with very little scaring. While the developing countries' economic outlook, particularly the poor of them, looks much worse, that is what the IMF sees in its latest research. On this topic and on how the world avoided a systemic debt crisis amid the pandemic, IMF's Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva, joined Mohamed El Erian, President of Queen's College, Cambridge University, and Vera Songwe, United Nations Undersecretary General and Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission, for Africa in a panel discussing the uh, in a panel to discuss averting a COVID-19 debt trap in Washington DC take a look we have some good news but we also see danger danger in divergence in uh, economic fortunes of advanced economies and developing economies uh, so why are people worried of uh, a potential debt problem? They have reason to be worried. We entered the pandemic with high level of debt. And during this year and five months since we are in it, understandably, debt levels went further up. Why? Because revenues went down and expenditures went up. Today, public debt globally is reaching 100% of GDP. Within this, advanced economies have jumped the most, nearly 20%. Emerging markets, nearly 10%. Low-income countries, 5%. Now, we know that the best solution to this is higher growth. And that remains by far the most desirable solution. But as Cecilia just said, we also have to recognize that developing countries are facing significant headwinds. Tourism isn't going to come back quickly. Remittance flows aren't going to come back quickly. FDI is going to become remain uncertain. And all this is happening in the midst of the pandemic. So there is no easy growth path out of this in the short term. First of all, I think SDRs release yesterday. Second, uh, we do need more transparency so that we can understand how you resolve the debt. Third, we need the private sector to come to the table and come to the table both in terms of reducing market access because countries are still going to need to go to the markets. And finally, recapitalization of the MDB so that we get uh, additional resources out quickly. I feel very strongly that my institution has a responsibility to press very hard and uh, together with others, with the World Bank and others, to make it so that this mountain of debt that is often hidden from the naked eye can be exposed, that contracts are disclosed and the conditions in this contra contract sometimes ridiculous are for everybody to see. On that, I have a bit more hope that the situation now is becoming difficult to a point that countries that have been resisting transparency and actually on both sides are more open. This is a fundamental component. If we don't know what we're talking about, we can't fix it. Accelerated vaccinations and a flood of government spending, especially in the United States, have boosted the outlook for the global economy. But more must be done to prevent permanent scars. IMF Chief Economist Gita Gopinat said while representing presenting the 2021 World Economic Outlook. The International Monetary Fund's World Economic Outlook now sees global growth of 6.0% this year after the contraction of 3.3% in 2020 caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the worst peacetime downturn since the Great Depression a century before. Let's watch this. 21 April. Now, these divergent recovery paths are likely to create wider gaps in living standards across countries compared to pre-pandemic expectations. 
The average annual loss in per capita GDP over 2020 to 24 relative to pre-pandemic forecasts is projected to be 5.7% in low-income countries and 4.7% in emerging markets, while in advanced economies, the losses are expected to be smaller at 2.3%. Now, because the crisis has accelerated the transformative forces of digitalization and automation, many of the jobs lost are unlikely to return, requiring worker reallocation across sectors, which unfortunately often comes with severe earning penalties. Swift policy action worldwide, including $16 trillion in fiscal support, prevented far worse outcomes. Our estimates suggest last year's severe collapse could have been three times worse. Now, a high degree of uncertainty surrounds our projections. Faster progress with vaccinations can uplift the forecast, while a more prolonged pandemic with virus variants that evade vaccines can lead to a sharp downgrade. Multi-speed recoveries could pose financial risks if interest rates in the United States rise further in unexpected ways. This could cause inflated asset valuations to unwind in a disorderly manner. Right now, the emphasis should be on escaping the health crisis by prioritizing healthcare spending on vaccinations, treatments, healthcare infrastructure. Fiscal support should be well targeted to affected households and firms, and monetary policy should remain accommodative while proactively addressing financial stability risks. Stage. First and foremost, countries need to work together to ensure universal vaccination. While some countries will get to widespread vaccinations by the summer, most will likely have to wait till the end of next year. Speeding up vaccinations will require ramping up vaccine production and distribution, avoiding export controls, fully funding COVAX facility, and ensuring equitable global transfers of excess doses. LG Electronics, South Korea's second largest appliance firm after Samsung, is closing down its mobile phone business, according to the company, after the division lost billions in recent years. Now, the firm was once considered a pioneer of the Android operating system, collaborating with Google on the Nexus series in the early 2010s. But it has long struggled to increase sales, entering the market late and facing tough competition from emerging cheaper Chinese rivals such as Huawei. It was regularly listed among the world's top 10 smartphone manufacturers. But according to Tracker Counterpoint, the last time it recorded, a global market share of 3% or more was in the quarter, second quarter of 2018. LG reportedly held talks with Vietnam's uh, Vin Group over a potential sale. But it broke down over price differences, according to local reports. A total of 522 rail workers of the four rail services in the national capital region have so far tested positive for the coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19, according to the latest data from the Department of Transportation. In an advisory on Wednesday, the DOTR said 377 out of 1,185 workers of the light rail transit line 1 or LRT1 have been tested with 117 yielding positive results. In the light rail transit line 2, it said 571 out of its 1,277 workers have been tested with 143 returning positive for COVID-19. In the Metro Manila or Metro Rail Transit Line 3, MRT3, it said 860 out of its 3,284 workers have been tested with 131 found to be infected. In the Philippine National Rail Railways or PNR, it said 1,013 out of its 1,729 workers have so far undergone testing with 131 returning positive with COVID-19. The test results were recorded on Tuesday. Due to the limited number of personnel, operations of the PNR are currently suspended while the rest are operating on a limited capacity. To date, the LRT-1 is dispatching 17 trains, LRT-2 has 5 trains, while the MRT-R or MRT-3 has 14 trains.
On Monday, the DOTR reported a total of 478 confirmed infections from the four rail services. President Duterte issued an executive order temporarily modifying the rates of import duty on pork products to address the impact of the African swine fever on the country's hog industry. Under EO128, Duterte stressed the need to take immediate steps to allow the domestic swine industry to fully recover and attain sufficient local pork production. Hence, the president approved the National Economic and Development Authority's proposed temporary reduction of the most favored nation tariff rates on fresh, chilled, or frozen pork products. There is an urgent need to temporarily reduce the most favored nation tariff rates on fresh, chilled, or frozen meat on swine of swine to address the existing pork supply shortage, stabilize prices of pork meat, and minimize inflation rates, according to the EO. EO 128 reduces tariff rates for both in quota and out quota imports of pork to boost pork supply in the country and tame prices of pork products. President Duterte's latest EO reduces the MFN tariff rate on pork imports within the minimum access volume, or MAV, to 5% for the first three months upon the effectivity of the order and to 10% for the fourth to 12th month from the current rate of 30%. On the other hand, pork imports outside MAV will be slapped with a lower tariff of 15% for the next three months and 20% for the succeeding nine months from the current 40% based on EO128. EO128, which is effective for a period of one year, takes effect immediately upon its complete publication in the official gazette or in a newspaper of general circulation. Asian markets mostly rose on Thursday with traders keeping tabs on the Congress of U.S. President Joe Biden's huge infrastructure plan while also taking heart from Federal Reserve meeting minutes, reinforcing its intention to keep interest at record lows for an extended period. The broad gains came after yet another record for the S&P 500 on Wall Street, helped by a general mood of optimism that the world economy is on course for a strong recovery as vaccines are are rolled out. Investors are also keenly watching developments as Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen pushes for a global corporate tax on wealthy firms that have done well during the pandemic in order to finance recovery efforts. The idea has the support of the IMF, while G20 finance ministers said they would continue to work on a minimum rate as they look to undermine the use of tax havens with a deal possible by July. Asian markets were broadly up in early trade Thursday, Hong Kong, Sydney, Seoul, Taipei, or Taipei, Jakarta, Shanghai, and Wellington rose, while Tokyo, Singapore, and Manila were in the red. Crystal Nicole de Mario Quentinai had some Malaysian touch of food. Let's watch this. Hello, guys. I am Faye Barte. And I am Crystal Nicole de Mario Quentinai. We are here now in metropolis of Bangkok, Thailand, and we will take your taste buds to Penang, Malaysia. Let's go! Hello, everyone. Today, we are going to taste Penang, Malaysian food. Nicole, have you tried this before? Some of them, but some of this um, new are new for me. New for you, even to me, even to yeah. me. It's, it's really new for me. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited to try all of this. Now let's try, come on. Join us. Let's start with this. It's pesam board. sauce. So let's let's try this. Um, guys, this is I think this is tofu. This is fried fried flour, I think. This one is cucumbers. And of course, potato. 
Oh, and I think curry. And some eggs. Eggs. Okay. And then we'll get to the next one. Tastes good. I like it. When you take a bite of the tofu, you can taste a little bit sourness of it. But with a taste, uh, with a touch of sweetness also. And you can taste the peanut. We're going to grab one first. Okay. We'll get one. That's deep. This one. So this sauce, what's in it? I really don't know. Mm. Yeah, it's very, it's really amazing. So how about this one? I think if you want to put some spice on it, you can try it. But, but I think I'm not really good. I'm not really into the spice one. So I'm okay with this and then just dip in the curry. Wow. And I'm fine with it. Oh, guys. So good. What do you call this? Um, roti? I feel like this is my first time to try this one. Mm. But it's good. It's really good. Yeah, I tried this also before. And this, this one is really authentic. The taste is really authentic. Alright. Okay, Nicole. Um, the next food that we're about to eat, actually, I think this is the main course. Popular. And it has shrimp, noodles, and some vegetables also. And and that is really spicy food here in Thailand. Yeah. So, You're familiar with that? Yeah? Yes, I always eat Tom Yum. So I think if you guys love spicy food, you'll enjoy this one. Yes, this is a spicy food. <laughs> I'm warning that this is spicy. Oh, is it? <laughs> And this is 10 out of 10. It's really good, guys. Could really taste the spices. We finished eating the main course. Now we're going to have the dessert. Yeah, and the most exciting part. Okay, which one do you want to eat first, Kay? Hmm, I want to taste this first because this okay. really looks interesting. Yeah. This is dessert, but it has some onion leaves and chili. No, bell pepper, maybe. Yeah, so they call this Joya. Um, taro cake. And taro? It has, yeah, and it has, it has two bright sauce. Oh, okay, these are sauces. This one is spicy and this one is. I'm um, not sure. Not sure. <laughs> okay, let me taste this, the red one first. How does it taste? Is it spicy? Yeah. <laughs> so I should do anything spicy. One. But it's good. It's good. It matches the, the, the taste of that spiciness here in the car. Let's try. I hope you guys enjoyed our food trip today. And thank you for joining us. Eating Malaysian food from Bangkok, Thailand Bureau. I am Faye Barte. And I am Crystal Nicole Murukat. And we live in interesting times. Wow, that looks so good, Faye. You bring that over here. <laughs> <laughs> Malaysian, Malaysian food really brings you, or I mean, it will really brought you to, to a different culinary food. So that restaurant is serving Malaysian food, is that it? Yes, it, it was just a it, it was just an event for, mm -hmm. for the Malaysian people and oh. they cater Malaysian for for the Malaysian food and eventually Thai people also came there and Filipinos also. Oh, would love to try it after the pandemic. You should. <laughs> when? <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me company, Faye, and uh, for that feature on uh, your food trip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're always welcome, Alma, and we will continue to give the latest updates around Southeast Asian nation. This is Faye Barte from your EPC Thailand Bureau, and we live in interesting times. We'll see you back tomorrow. I'm Alma Angeles, and we live in interesting times.